Hello and welcome to today's webinar about AI and semantic SEO. Today we have wonderful guests and uh, the leader is Sherlock the Cat, our most profound <laughs> semantic <laughs> SEO expert here. Hi Sherlock. Uh, hello. <laughs> okay, it's okay. exciting. I'm happy. <laughs> we, I've, I've gathered the perhaps one of the best experts on semantic SEO here. They are wonderful in the one thing. They not only know theory, but they can actually implement it. Not only implement it for themselves, but also help their clients and help other people to find out about like the best users of SEO in the future. Everyone, please write where you are from in the chat. And uh, what's your greatest difficulty with AI and semantic search, if any? Uh, don't hesitate to ask questions all the way through. I'll be tracking them and uh, we'll make sure to ask our experts. You can uh, do that in the chat box. And I suggest you to subscribe to Duda, not to miss any future webinars. Uh, great. Uh, I know that everyone knows you already. You are quite famous and uh, you've got lots of case studies and you are the leaders, CEO and founder of Holistic SEO community and agency. Can you tell, tell us more about yourself? And uh, if you think that SEO is doomed after Google's <laughs> SGE search generative experience uh, introduction. <laughs> you are muted. Thank you so much. First of all, actually, I can tell that I am one of the SEOs who read the uh, history of SEO and maybe since 1995. And I even have seen that actually, or I have read even the 23,000 of comments of the SEO guy in the uh, Webmaster World Forum, and probably he was Matt Katz. And I can tell that I have seen this is SEO doomed context many times, and nearly every year uh, we tell that SEO is that, and here we are again <laughs> we're talking about SEO. So I can tell that we are not doomed. As long as uh, free economy is out there and the search engines are alive, we will be continuing to actually do what we are doing. And at the same time, when it comes to the, uh, my own journey, I have started doing SEO actually around 2015. I started from the casino industry and from the Black Hat side, especially with the PBNs. And then we had lots of uh, good successes there. During the medical update, we lost everything, including millions. Then I started to come to the White Hat side a little bit further. So then I started to create some case studies uh, with my experiences in the Black Hat side to explain how the search engines work. And one day uh, I found myself in interviews or webinars or different places. Usually I was writing for myself, then it became on a different level, uh, I can tell. And we have an agency, we have a community, we also have a, a course and things are going well at the moment. And, that's it. and also I am father of this cute thing. <laughs> okay, you can go. Thank you. Robert, you're also very famous in the SEO community. And uh, whenever I ask about who's the second after a Corey person, uh, or not second or first in uh, your area, who knows about typical authority, AI, semantic search, or who can like help with uh, this kind of things, uh, all say that you are the one. Can you tell us more about yourself and uh, how all these things about AI actually impacted how you work with your clients and SEO in general? So uh, thanks uh, for having me and for a lovely words. Uh, I'm Phil. Uh, as an anonymous guy from Poland, and it's good to hear that I'm well recognized worldwide and uh, in the SEO industry, so it's great to hear it. Uh, and I will do it best to follow the correct step and uh, sometimes jump above my master, let's say. Um, and yeah, I'm CTO in Vestigio. I'm sure it's quite, it's uh, one of the first data science SEO agency in the world, if not the first one. Uh, we are focusing on uh, data because of my business partner. He runs something like um, Hrefs or SEM Rush for Polish market. So. Uh, Senuto. So uh, he has a lot of data, um, historical data about Polish internet, and we are trying to develop strategies for client base on the big data perspective uh, and whole market or whole country perspective instead of uh, just a keyword or niche, whatever. 
Uh, and yeah, because of this, I'm trying to develop myself uh, in a field of uh, AI or, you know, I'm, j I'm just the engineer. And let's say I understand. And I'm trying to connect dots and uh, AI for me is, you know, game changer to take something from here, from here, from him, connect dots and, uh, and let's say have a great output and you will see my presentation, uh, but I mean, yeah. I, I won't spoil it. You did it on Facebook today and Twitter and LinkedIn. Yeah. Uh, you will see in my presentation and yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Well, I'm looking forward to it as well. But uh, Corey will start with his first uh, because we need to explain yeah. some con the concepts and uh, everything around uh, large language models and AI and semantic SEO before we proceed to actual questions and to some implementation. Um, Greg, can you share your presentation, please? So <clears throat> we have 27 slides here, and I will be quick to explain these concepts. And some of the audience already know these concepts, but still, I also know that whenever people listen to these things, they also recognize new things too. So when it comes to the concept of the topical authority, uh, the phrase and the concept, they are different from each other because in the search engine optimization, at least I am using it in a different way. And most of the time when I say the topical authority, the audience might be understanding something else than I am explaining uh, from. First of all, topical authority is actually about the cost. First of all, let's say the search engine ranks you. And if they rank you, it is mainly for making money, which means that they are also ranking your website because the search engine also wants to make money from your website. They don't rank you because they just like you. And in this case, the cost and quality, these two things are always balanced with each other. Let's say your website is quality, but the cost is two times more than your quality. It means that you are not worth to crawl, index, or also rank at the same time. And because of these type of things, and I was reading these research papers for a really long time, and I have realized that uh, there are there are all the concerns, or let's say most of the concerns when it comes to the search engine and information science patterns, they're always around relevance, responsiveness, we can unite them as quality and the cost. Everything that we see there, these are always about quality and the cost balance. So basically, you can also try to ask a question like, how much should the search engine spend so that you can actually rank in that area? And after one year, what kinds of a value you are giving back to the search engine via the users? So we call these things in the context of cost of ranking or cost of retrieval. In this case, cost of ranking a website can't be higher than cost of not ranking the website. And this is one of the fundamental mottos in my methodologies. An entire topical authority methodology concept or hierarchy there that I am implementing all the case studies and more than 70 websites in the case studies just for the last two years. And other websites I didn't publish, uh, but shared maybe with a screenshot. All of them actually coming from mainly this specific motto or the mindset. If one day search engines realize that actually there is a cheaper way for ranking the websites besides the topical authority or something else, then they will be implementing it. Because the first priority for the search engine is not safety quality. It is always about cost and the money. And one more thing before moving here, because I'm trying to establish a mindset shift here. If you tell me what Google is, I wouldn't tell Google is a search engine. The first thing that Google is actually an ads company. So the Google, you should understand them first as an ads company, and they always want to make money. It's their always first prioritization. And they might try to be sound different in social media, of course, like every company. And you know what Apple does in Africa, but what Apple shows in the commercials. So this is also one of my mottos because uh, Kremlinology is one of the concepts that I am using in SEO. So basically official search engine result pages, they are very much more important for me than what the search engines actually tell. So in this context, if we continue here, <clears throat> To be able to understand the concept of cost of ranking or cost of retrieval, we should first understand what 
what this specific cost is. And here we have a hypothetical question. Let's say we have a website A, then the website B. In this case, you can see that actually website A has 600 content item, let's say web pages, 900 triples, and 59 accuracy and three connected topics, and clarity is around seven to eight percentage. And you see the metrics of the website B. B is very much bigger website than the A. In this case, many people think that when the website is bigger, it is actually costlier. But this approach is not correct, actually. The search engines, they always tend to satisfy more users with less resources. Because if I am able to satisfy very much more users and the queries with very much less websites, it means that the total cost that I need to spend will be less. So this approach is also called information foraging. And this concept is also related to the political science or many things in, in mathematical uh, calculations too. If I give you a hypothetical example, if you want to eat in a restaurant, you wouldn't check every restaurant in the city. Most probably you will be checking one or two restaurants, then you will sit somewhere. And they, usually that somewhere is this place closest to you. You don't try to go to the most quality restaurant in entire city and you don't spend that much time. And users, and they are Markovian, and they are also similar to this specific state as search engines too. Search engines, actually, they don't have to try or they don't have to rank your website as well. I always tell my clients, my partners, and also my own teammates too, Google doesn't need your website, basically. When you give them another web page to rank, you are just giving, let's say, 14 trillion page to them and their systems probably they won't be surprised based on your web page so in this case to satisfy 9 million search queries they won't be ranking 9 million different websites if i'm able to satisfy 9, 9 million search queries and millions of topics and billions of users with a single website i will be sticking with it and that's why the bigger websites like amazon or others they are helpful for Google at the same time, even if they are also competitors, because Google is able to use them for satisfying their own users and other e-commerce websites or other type of websites too, they are using this. So basically, topical authority is born from the idea of decreasing the cost of retrieval. It is about helping search engines to make money. And in this case, you need to understand the concept of actually Okay. And in this case, you actually need to understand the query responsiveness. So the query responsiveness in this case, actually, it means that <clears throat> you might have the relevance for a specific query and relevance might be helpful for you to rank higher. But as long as you don't have a responsive sentence there, or let's say, as long as you don't have a proper distributional semantics and discourse integration, it won't be helpful. So let me explain these two concepts quickly for you. For instance, Stephen the Baker, as a former Googler, right now he works in Apple for Apple search engine, and he directly tells in his research paper that he found that if there, if there are three grams in a question and also in the answer that are matching with each other, he finds that the satisfaction of the users are increased 36 percentage. So in this case, they assume that if there are mutual words or if there is if there is not vocabulary gap between the question and between the answer, they assume that answer is responsive. So relevance is about actually distributing the connected concepts and certain type of entities and attributes, but responsiveness is about word compositionality, sentence format, sentence structures, and how the sentence are following each other. Then it is called discourse integration. And the next step is actually optimizing a little bit the, let's say, accuracy, of course. So this is actually the one of the important thing here is that you will realize that uh, these seven steps here, fine tune a large language model, create a topical map, create a semantic content network, generate content, include human effort, improve your knowledge base, make your website a speaking AI. I can tell that in the future of the search engine optimization, whatever you do, it will be one of these seven steps. 
basically you will have a knowledge base then you will be verbalizing the knowledge base by using a large language model but you will need to fine tune it because if you use the same large language model with your competitor you will be having high level of similarity and something that the search engines will be evading that's why you will actually need a kind of fine-tuned technology there then you will be creating a topical map and semantic content network which means that actually you need actually to take the course to understand these two things in a proper way because there are six fundamental concepts for these and there are many other things for that but basically imagine that we verbalize all of these knowledge base in the best format so that search engines can actually have less cost with higher responsiveness. Then we generate content and include the human effort. This right section is about that because in the Google Quality Rated Guidelines, Google added a section and directly they tell that actually, if a human is involved with the content, Google assumes that it is more quality. So it means that the meaning of the quality has been changed a little bit for Google, because even if the human involvement makes content less quality, Google assumes that it's better. And in this case, after you verbalize your knowledge base, you will need to have a human or human touch in your content. And there are lots of already uh, different type of language models to recognize, uh, let's say, non-human involved content. So in this case, the thing that you see here, every bubble here that you see, these are different type of knowledge bases. And in every knowledge base that here you see, there might be billions of triples. For instance, DBpedia is also here too. Some of these knowledge bases, they're about diseases. Some of them are about motorbikes. Some of them are about wars or armies. Once you have these knowledge bases, the next thing that you can do is verbalizing them. If you have 8 billion triples, you can classify them according to the, their, let's say, topicality. Then you can connect them to the certain queries in the search engine. Then you can generate questions for them. Then you can generate answers for them. Then you can also distribute internal links, which means that in the future, we can have website engines to just print the websites with small micro differences. And I call this section as the micro semantics which means that if you are able to create even 0.1 percentage difference compared to your competitor in millions of web pages, this 0.1 percentage difference, it will be multiplied with total web page count and it will be creating a really great difference for ranking. So that's why optimizing small things in a site-wide way will be creating really good differences in the programmatic SEO, and I call it micro semantics. Here too, at the left side, you see an example of actually verbalization directly. When it comes to here too, this is an SEO chatbot. Uh, one of our friends, Mike, actually created it from Romania. And basically, the thing that he has done here is that he has taken all of our case studies and, and even sometimes our videos and SEO by the sea content. And then he actually created a vector database by using embeddings. And the next step is using LangChain and as much as I can remember, GBT. So the next step here is actually basically, let's say you didn't understand something. You come here, you ask your question, you get the answer. If you tell me what is the difference between this and GBT, the main difference here is that Every answer here, it is directly coming from, only from our knowledge base. That's why the seventh step that there I mentioned, it is about make your website a speaking website. Have a private knowledge base, then improve this private knowledge base and protect it for all costs. Because you will be using that knowledge base for creating content and also making your website speaking with your users, whether it is for convergence, whether it is for regular interaction. And this is a live example for that. All the course trainees right now, they are asking lots of questions here. And even sometimes they ask whether I am an alien or not but still at least they are using it uh, for certain type of answers. And in this area too, for instance, we, you see a kind of multi-chain reasoning. Basically, this is uh, augmentation of the information retrieval. And here, for instance, if you see a sentence like, we paid 20 at the Buckingham Palace gift shop, we know that Buckingham Palace is located in the United Kingdom. Official currency of the United Kingdom is pound. And here, the search engine is able to actually understand your content in a better way. This is directly coming from Google. But the thing here is that if you 
leave these things like this. If you use an ambiguous sen sentence structure, if you use ambiguous uh, content, it will be really harder for the search engine to understand your content. That's why in that cost comparison, you have seen the clarity. If your sentence is not clear enough, it means that the search engine will need to be using more expensive algorithms and more callbacks and more, let's say, algorithm iterations to understand you. And if your website is not worth that, after a point, they will give up. I know that Google is using three different tires in their index indices, which means that tier one websites are being served from the best possible servers and tier three websites are being served from older servers at the same time, in the search of the record podcast, they approved this information. So imagine that according to the qualities even, they put more quality websites to the more quality servers because they always want to protect them because they know that they are making money from these websites. And topical authority is about actually being on that specific classification. So I will be quicker from for this moment. This is a, a patent screenshot to show how these things are being turned into the actual reality. Basically, there are different type of embeddings here. Important part here is that this is cross-lingual. And you can see a live example of this here too. I use a same simple sentence here with different languages, then I embed them. And you realize that similar languages actually create closer embeddings to each other, even if they are from different languages. Because search engines, even if you use different languages, they're able to understand you because semantics are language agnostic. In this section, you see actually, uh, let's say, <clears throat> an embedding projection you can crawl your website and you can create these type of things every bubble that you see here they represent a contextual domain distance between the bubbles they represent the relevance between them if i click one of these the most relevant other embeddings will be highlighted and there are probable probabilities or the different type of word compositionalities between these bubbles. According to these bubble connections, you can actually improve your own content. And you will realize that actually, whenever you click one of these, every highlight will be connected different type of queries and the query clustering algorithms of search engine. So this is also from, again, the, uh, from Google, a really important document representation patent it is from david c tyler and basically david tells that they are actually or they can and they should be actually creating contextual domains between different type of web components here you see that there is a domain one and you see that there is a domain six these things are not ordered randomly the david here from google he assumes that if you want to create a website that comes from domain one to domain six you will need to touch 11, 9, or these nameless small intersecting areas. So many people ask how to create a topical map. If you have a, a contextual domain in your website from 1, 4, and 8 at the same time, you will need to also cover these between zone or intersecting zone. He also tells that there is always a main and also micro context or macro and micro context inside the documents. When it comes to here too, there is a simple example. Basically, when I click the ultrasonic, you see that cleaners are highlighted. When I click the cleaners, also you will see that quartz are highlighted here. But if I click quartz, ultrasonic is not highlighted anymore, which means that the cleaners is a mutual point for both of these contextual domains. If your website touches three of these things at the same time, you will need to understand how to process these things together. If I use quotation marks to search both of these things, hexagon and ultrasonic, here you will see that actually the main context, main context here is actually ultrasonic wave type. And in this case, if your website is not relevant to this specific entity, you will need to change the angle or you will need to bend the meaning of the words. And that part is a little bit tricky thing in the semantic SEO because it's not always giving the best information you can change the perception of the search engine at the same time. And here too, we use a specific type of tool to create the same type of embeddings or the word compositionality graph or word graph text graph from the ranking pages. And here we understand what kinds of pages are ranking and how these concepts are connected to each other. And in this section too, you can see that industrial ultrasonic cleaning machines is the macro context. If you search quartz and the cleaner together. And in this case, 
with this type of topical clusters too, you can understand the heavy context inside the, let's say the Google, and you can actually create better content briefs and better co topical maps by using these type of embeddings and also the word compositionality graphs at the same time. In this area, for instance, when we search for the quartz and the ultrasonic at the same time, we see that crystal, for instance, this is one of the main contexts for with 22% crystal roller and quartz are appearing together. And in the fourth section, we see that micro machine processing section, we see that and sonic appears there too. If you mention crystal and sonic together, so close to each other, for instance, it will be a mistake. That's why you will need to create a heavy macro context and a small micro context area to distribute the contextual flow in a proper way. And uh, you can examine the case of the websites to understand it better. So last four slides. This section here, as you remember, uh, that's seven steps that I have shown you before. Find the knowledge base, verbalize the knowledge base, and then try to to reiterate the process by improving, let's say, micro semantics and macro semantics. So when it comes to fine tuning a language model, here you see language interpretability tool from Google. And in this section, for instance, an NLP engineer tries to make two different concepts more distant to each other or closer to each other. To be able to do that, actually, he touches a specific type of embedding then he checks the connections between them in terms of these specific words then he connects a word to another with manual changes you will be able to do these things in the future with simpler tools at the same time at the at the right bottom corner you see that it with what probability which word has been connected to which word and in this section, you will see a bigger version of it here too. If we use a sentence here directly, for instance, large language model, blah, blah, type of sentence, it directly shows you that which word can be connected to which word with what probability. So you remember the bubbles that we clicked before? All these bubbles are connected to each other in a similar way here too. According to the connections that you are using, search engine classifies your document in a, in a different way. And that's why sometimes I had told this in Zakopane, I told this in also Saigon as well. It's not about helpful content, unfortunately, and helpful content update actually can go to hell. It's not about helping, it's about actually scores, it's about math and the search engine engineers or let's say spokespersons, they might not want you to focus on the math side. They usually tell that leave the algorithms us, we, you can just write great content, we will understand you. But you can tell something like to do your cl client or to do your partner or your team. So that's why you should understand these connections. You might be telling the same thing to, in two different ways. For instance, if your search query that you are targeting is financial advisor and family connection, in this case, you should be using this sentence. Financial advisor helps families to achieve financial independence. In this case, you see that actually the heaviest concept here is advisor. And now I say the same thing, same meaning with a different word order and compositionality. Families achieve financial independence with the help of financial advisor. Now we see that actually families are the heaviest term here. And this time you can target a query like family plus financial independence here. So if the query that you are targeting has the financial advisor in it, you should use this sentence. If it has family context heavier, you should be using this sentence. And I call this relevance configuration. So both of these sentences are helpful at the same level, but the relevance changes, responsiveness changes. So you need to understand this specific context at the same time. And there is also an example here in the Google's own support forum. This person tells that I was searching for where to buy purple yams, but the search engine was giving an answer like something like, let's say, sweet potatoes. Because according to that specific moment, search engine assumed that purple yams are a conditional synonym with the sweet potatoes. And even these type of bugs, they are appearing always. Googlers, they tell that they have actually millions of baby algorithms. I tell that they have billions of bugs. So we have a little bit different mindsets or let's say angles with them. And if you want to join our public communities, you can use this specific uh, QR code that has been created by dear Olegio. And thank you for that. She's smarter than us. We were sending the links one by one. So you can use this uh, awesome technology. And thank you for listening to me. That's it. Thank you, Corey. It was wonderful. We have like 
uh, lots of appreciation and comments about that. But can you return the slides back, please, and uh, return two two of them back, three back, three a bit back. Wait, yes, this one. Uh, John Wright is asking: Is this R Studio or for database? Uh, can you tell it one more time, please? Is this... uh, John Wright is: Is this R Studio for the database? None of them, actually. This is Expert. Expert is a language model. Uh, it is an extension language model uh, to the Bird of op open model of Bird. Closed model is hidden by Google anyway. So the public model has been modified to visualize the word connections. Basically, you give a sentence and it shows you the probable probabilities, but probabilities come from the open public version of the bird, basically. And basically, it is coming from 2020 version of it nearly. So, you, But you can use the same algorithm or visualization with different type of LLMs, and you can check how they perceive things at the same time. OK. Thank you so much. And uh, now I want to pass the next word to Robert because he has something to add from his side and his views. And also there will be some quotes from Saigon as far as I can know. Yeah, so my, my presentation, yeah? yeah. So, yes. uh, yeah, so it's, it's a part of my presentation from Saigon uh, with fancy title. I won't reveal it, uh, but it's a quite fancy one and vulgar one, so I won't tell you. Uh, but the whole concept I want to show you is a bit of extension of uh, Korai uh, uh, presentation. Uh, he mentioned uh, verbalization of knowledge base, building a knowledge base, uh, fine-tuning language models, etc., etc. And let me show you same thing from the engineer perspective and how to take advantage uh, uh, on it uh, even tomorrow. Uh, yeah. So the thing is, ingredients matter. Corey mentioned that everybody uses same language model. Of course, there is dozens of language models on the market, but let's say 85% or 88 or whatever, 100% of SEO use OpenAI on ChatGPT or let's name it as GPT 3.5 or GPT 4. And in the long run, there will be inflation of the content in the internet with the same quality, uh, with uh, let's say same quality, um, because all language, large language models are based on probability. So let's say the probability of existence then of existence of the next token in sentence is let's say endless. So in the long run, uh, the, 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 there will be a lot of same quality content. So let's imagine we have a black box. Our black box, it could be like, uh, you know, Google. It could be AI. And all we can control and do it is a uh, input. So in, for example, in AI is a prompt and the output. And uh, so the result AI gave us. And all, all, trust me, all controllers, dynamic system in the world are based on feedback, like iterative procedure. Prompt, output, feedback based on output, fine tune the prompt, output, and iterative process to make the output, uh, let's say, uh, good enough to publish it uh, uh, online. Um, the thing is, we have to treat AI as the best language processor, not as the source of the knowledge, because even today, the data set uh, in GPT-4 is out, outdated, it's from 2021. And of course, there's a lot of change, changes in the world. And yeah, so it's the first step. Don't treat a uh, large language model as a source. And because of it, we need to feed it. There's two options. We can fine tune, which is not possible in GPT-4, but uh, the, the, the number of tokens we can put is quite decent so we can fit with latest information structures data and uh, then we can print and verbalize our input or our data we put in a, in and you know and in the input to to ai and because of it uh yeah print 
website or content based on some extra data instead of relying on uh, outdated data set in, in OpenAI. Let me show you an example what I mean and how you can do it uh, even tomorrow. Okay, let's take some random weight loss supplement. The name is Keto Guru. It's, let's say, random. I don't know anything about this supplement. But we can, let's say, copy paste the content and the whole information about this. Um, I guess it's in, in the animation here. Oh, it's not working. Do you see the animation or not? Animation. No, it, do, it doesn't really work <laughs> here, but no problem. Uh, we can share the slides and everyone can watch them afterwards. Okay, so let me explain what I did. I copy paste the, uh, the content. There's an animation, so uh, Olesha will share it with you. I try to ex extract the entities the common word, the information uh, from the content is a supplement. So I'm extracting ingredients and all common words, topics uh, uh, about the, um, the supplement. And I'm copy pasting uh, other supplement. It's a black latte also from for uh, weight loss. And here you see at the, at the top entities I extracted for Keto Guru, terms and topics. Uh, I extracted the prompt and human grade uh, description of the product, human grade review. And at the bottom of the animation, uh, I just enter the entities and term and topic from the different product, same prompt with no competition. And the AI based on the, let's say, extracted information, some small knowledge base about the supplement generate human grade uh, review. Uh, yeah, it's how it works. And you add as much, uh, let's say, entities, information at the, at the input, so the output will satisfy the quality. Uh, and yeah, if you do it in scale, uh, the, the results will be amazing. A <sighs> few steps uh, how to do it. First of all, Think and look for some data. You can scrap, scrape uh, Amazon for products. You can scrape a health line for product review, whatever. Get some data, even Google Maps, and scrape it, download some, somehow, and index somewhere. In database, you can go for uh, Google Sheets, whatever. Index your data somewhere and try to extract the information. You will uh, see the animation so you will understand how I did it. But from the content, try to extract in most important information. Try to proceed, process the whole data you, 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 you scrape uh, clean because uh, there is also a lot of noise in data. Try to match uh, to build further taxonomies or structure, even cities, uh, states, whatever, to make a structure based on data. Uh, for example, it's a a database of all SWIFT code in the world, with all banks in the world. It's 81,000 banks. And it's quite easy to print or generate the website with SWIFT code based on this data. Just structure it, match it, put it to AI, and you can print the whole website based on it. Same here. Here's all banks in Brazil. 46,000 banks or banks, uh, banks address in Brazil. It's quite easy to print or generate the website with banks in Brazil, whatever you can use, whatever you want. Even in Google Sheets, uh, in database, it could be easier to clean data and proceed with whole process, but you can do it also in Google Sheets. It's a database of, of all shops in the United States. As you see, I, I, I pick a Walmart as, a, um, as an example and organizing data based on it and put it into AI will bring the result, which is uh, named as a verbalization of knowledge base. So yeah, organize, organize prompt, scripts, and print. Yeah, then fact and quality check and add a little bit of human effort to be, you know, to satisfy the user intent because whole AI, generated website, it's not about content, it's about satisfying an intent. If someone's looking for a bank in Brazil, he's looking for a bank, not for the content about the bank. 
if someone is looking for Swift code, as I showed you, he's looking for Swift code, not the surrounding content you uh, you generated based on AI. Then fine tune, repeat, and it's the game. Uh, it's the name of a game, and let's say master plan for big boys uh, now and in near future. If you wanna uh, jump after this webinar, jump to Matt Digity show. Like like two weeks ago, he published the case study of a uh, huge website that guy guys made like uh, one million dollar something like that in two in two months. So yeah, they did everything I mentioned before. So yeah, let me show you some data source examples. So first of all, my favorite one is Appify. The, their, their claim was uh, we will make a, a API for each website in the world. You have a lot of uh, ready, let's say, plugins or data source there. So you can uh, jump there and rapid API. There is a lot of data you can use to build your knowledge base and then print the website. And my favorite one is a Google. I will show you an example at the end. But what you can extract from Google, people also ask iteratively, which will build you the representation of questions and perception how Google understand the question and connect each other, uh, related questions and content from website, headings from the website, and it's the best source to generate um, print website and content. Um, the thing is, Cora mentioned the embedding, but he showed you embedding based on some different models on different, let's say, we try to embed keyword based on a, um, open AI ADA model, which is the best for embedding. But in my opinion, the best option is to embed or not embed, but cluster and the Google result and embed keywords based on Google result instead of uh, some other models. And what you can do, as I mentioned, uh, extract the people also ask and try to cluster, not keyword, but cluster the question Google has in people also ask, then extend it, and you will see what happened. Uh, you will teach Google about uh, some extra question or extra stuff they don't understand yet. Uh, like Cora, I mentioned this yum and sweet potatoes. Yeah, um, try it. Trust me, uh, it's a it's a it's a great tip. And the proof, what I showed you is, you know, building the input, trying to make input big enough to satisfy the output. And look, at the beginning, I mentioned my business partner uh, company Senuto. They produce the article is shout out to Cora about Iskander Kebab. And to produce this article, they crawled the whole SERPs and all websites uh, about uh, Iskander and they put 4,000 tokens for input to get the, the output and the content. And ask yourself, ask yourself about your prompts, how you you uh, write, let's say, write me paragraph about payday loans or write me article or blog post about something. And ask yourself what will happen if you feed large language model at the input and results are totally different and it's the name of a game and it's how you can win uh, with your competitors who will stay in short prompt and uh, relying on outdated knowledge bases or data set from 2021. And yeah, and my shout out to you is uh, be an SEO engineers instead of uh, imitating. And, you know, it is, it is the era of engineers online right now because of the, the technology we have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Robert. And here's the slide with uh, Robert's contacts. You can follow him on Twitter and you can write emails to him. And uh, Corey also mentioned, I heard that uh, SEOs now are engineers. Corey, do you think we might break Google if we are all engineering this stuff? 
Yeah, actually, I can tell that this is one of the dangers uh, for Google at the moment because in the before they were managing SEO so easily with their own influencers or Google approved SEOs or conferences. But right now they have direct engineers against en engineers too, and we understand what they are doing. And it's not just us too. Even right now, creating a semantic search engine is so easy. We can directly actually use common crawl database and we can turn it into an index and we can actually use certain type of relevance algorithms and we can put another actually search engine there so right now i can tell that seo engineer i believe it's a great concept and i guess every seo should have an engineering mindset in a direct way as much as possible and it is something that is helpful for the agencies or the communities in the seo field and i guess it will be an inevitable change eventually yeah. Uh, Alexandra Amar is asking, what are some resources that we can use to learn to fine tune large language models and turn our websites into a speaking AI? Robert, I've seen your presentation in Saigon. I know you know lots of tools. Can you recommend anything? Yeah, but the, but, but the thing is I'm focusing on open AI stuff and it's only possible to fine tune this uh, GPT-3. And I rather prefer to feed GPT-4 because it's more, let's say, it's just a better model. And as for no-code uh, stuff, um, there is something like Riku.io, I guess. Uh, it's no-code, uh, let's say, system to fine-tune uh, model. And as for this, you know, professional. Uh, uh, let's see, solution head direct to documentation and there is everything you need. Uh, and the, the whole syntax, uh, uh, prompt, completion, how to prepare it, how to do it. And, and yeah, I, I'm, it's, it's better to just to head, head, head straight to the documentation of uh, OpenAI uh, models instead of my explanation in this case. It's quite a simple process. Yes. Uh, Corey, uh, you uh, always want to optimize lots of websites for the same niche, to, mo to monopolize it in a way. So what do you do in these cases? How do you fine tune your large language model? Do you make a small one for each of the, of the websites or do you use the same? And what do you use as a tool to do that? So first of all, uh, when you actually have any kinds of large language model, one of the things that you can do is that you can actually take all the websites that even didn't lose a single spam update or even a single, let's say, core algorithm update. You can crawl all their web pages. You can script all their content. And if you have enough level of tokens, you can start to embed it as well. Then slowly, there are some even new uh, LLM technologies. Basically, you give them the, your own embeddings then an existing an existing LLM, they start to actually increase the probabilities of occurrences of the embeddings that you have given to them. They even close the vocabulary gap or the context gap for you. So this way you can directly start to imitate even actually your competitors if you want. Or you can also tell that, for instance, directly, you can even start to actually directly tell them that, uh, let's say, for instance, Whenever there is a Boolean question, like yes or no question, you can directly create a certain rule there. Always start by yes or no. Or sometimes if there is, let's say, the confidence score is lower than 96 percentage, you can start or you can choose different type of sentence starting there. Like it depends, it varies, it changes according to the X, Y, Z factors type of uh, templates you will need to be creating and template generation it is also one of the things that you can use basically for certain type of questions you can create certain type of templates then the, for the rest llm can just actually put specific type of words with the templates that you created and that these templates are like this a noun let's say a noun an adjective an adverb or blah blah type of roles you can define and the LM can just fill the blanks according to the context. So you can create these type of templates or many other things. When it comes to the resources, if you want to do this without using any kinds of tool or any kinds of platform, you will actually need to learn lots of NLP libraries and start from LangChain at least. Even LangChain is not zero. Uh, by saying zero, I mean it has many interfaces for you as ready to go. 
but LangChain will be a good start there. You can check Cohere. It is also one of the actual systems there. You can also check it too. And uh, I will suggest you to check a little bit, let's say, simple things first, like Space, for instance. It is also an NLP library. It will be a really good. It will be a good start uh, for a starter. Then you can move on to the Cohere or LangChain, and from there you can actually download any LLM from Hugging Face, and you can start changing them as you wish. Uh, Osgur Yazici uh, from Turkey, I guess, is asking uh, if, uh, like you mentioned, that uh, lang large language models, they are language agnostic and uh, knowledge graphs are language agnostic. But the words order matters uh, depending on the language and the man depending on the context. So what is your walk around? Please? So the thing is actually semantics are uh, language agnostic, which means that meanings uh, are universal. But still, uh, when it comes to the words, or let's say in the linguistic philosophy, any word has been called as reference, reference to a meaning. Usually to explain it, I give the example of a pharmacy. For instance, pharmacies in the United States, they also sell cosmetic products. But when it comes to the pharmacies in the Europe, they don't sell actually cosmetic products, which means that actually if you use an LLM, you should be sure that actually you put a distance between pharmacy and the cosmetic words or cosmetic products or commercial cosmetic context. And in this case, we can tell that same word or same phrase, even same language, Slightly, it might mean different things, and according to that, you will need to change the embeddings or the distances between contexts. So, semantics are language agnostic, but LLMs they have to rely on certain type of probabilities. Probabilities come from large amount of documents, like millions of uh, tokens or billions, and in this case, it relies on languages of the documents. I can tell. Yeah, thank you, Robert. Kurushank Bishar is asking if there are any AI tools to generate topical maps. Can you say something? Uh, uh, you know, as I mentioned in my presentation, we are uh, uh, we as uh, SEO industry we are in the same swimming pool and we are playing, as I mentioned, uh, in the same probability of next token. Uh, I'm not sure. Is it any proper uh, or good tool, AI tool to generate the whole map? But if you add or let's say add a lot of um, the example data from Google, etc., you can extend what you see in Google from Google perspective because our name of a game is a Google game, not AI game at the end of the day and use AI to extend. And the best option is uh, your brain plus simple, the simplest chat GPT to extend what you take from Google. Even uh, people also ask headings from website, clean in AI, and then ask AI how to extend this, how to write something more, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then build a proper, uh, proper, proper map in, instead of rely only on same swimming pool and data set that every, every SEO uh has uh you can jump to senuto they are trying to build uh um, content map planning stuff based on keywords relations graphs etc uh, but it's not a hundred percent perfect tool uh so at the end of the day uh you need to rely on yourself and even clean the AI output and extend output. Uh, yeah, I, I, yeah. What do you think uh, about using knowledge bases for creating like the initial topic uh, uh, topical map? Taking some third party it, database and the knowledge base and creating a map uh, from it. I've never tried uh, to to do it this way. I'm more like, as, as I mentioned, Google guy and guy who's scrapping, scraping Google perspective and data from Google and then building base on it instead of some external knowledge bases uh, in this case. Uh, so I hadn't, I never tried it. Maybe it's an option. I'm not, I'm not sure. I, I will rely on Google and, and extend. Uh, Corey, what do, what do you think? 
because you've mentioned, I think, I think I've, I've seen that slide where you mentioned the knowledge yeah. uh, basis. So the thing here is that there is always a difference between a topical map and a conceptual map. You can use them as a conceptual map. You can show which concept has been connected to which concept. One second, Sherlock, I am talking. Do you hear the Sherlock at the same time? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> So he tries to play actually at the same time. So it's the danger if I don't allow him to sleep. Anyway, so you can create actually a conceptual map in a direct way. Uh, but when it comes to the topical maps, they rely on the relevance calculation. And sometimes you will need to put multiple concepts, which means multiple entities or the multiple facts to do to the same web page. In this case, topical map shows the pages that you will need to be opening. And it will be better to use actually, let's say, an element information retrieval understanding for that. Okay. By by uh, conceptual map, concept map. Do you mean entity based map? Uh, yes, actually. In a way, you you will be creating a kind of conceptual <laughs> conceptual map. Imagine that you put all the diseases uh, into a hierarchy, but it doesn't mean that actually you will need to be opening. Uh, a, a different page for all of them and for instance the other day i was i was creating actually a kind jealous of, <laughs> i guess oh yes i was actually creating a kinds of uh, topical map for let's say air conditioning brands but i have seen that besides the dyson none of them was that much important so instead of putting there a note for let's say all the air conditioning brands and the manufacturers, I have put alternatives to Dyson because I wanted to take the Dyson to the center or the central part as much as possible. So if you use a knowledge base, you will need to open different pages for every brand, but then you will be diluting ranking signals. But if you use information retrieval understanding, you will realize that you should put actual Dyson to the center and other brands should be around them. So there are a little bit difference there like that. Yes. And the next question is from Nicola von uh, Götze. Uh, can you give us some ideas how to find algorithmic authorship rules to optimize answer formats and sentence structures for different question formats? First, Corey, and then Robert. Okay. Yeah. So that actually, you can even use, uh, you can even use actually, for instance, Siamese bird or sentence bird. It is actually an NLP algorithm or also a library. You can use it for actually scoring your own answers. You can actually change your own answer. You can check the S bird or CMEs and sentence bird. You can check which which sentence structure creates the highest 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 score for you and why. Then you can actually return some of the NLP, uh, let's say, libraries or some blocks, and you can read and try to understand why it is happening like that. For instance, just yesterday night, actually, I was reading Cohere blog to understand the sentence similarity a little bit. And I, I learned a new concept there, which is called dot product. And they were trying to understand which movie has been similar to the which movie. It's not even sentences. They just check the movies by using all the dialogues. So you can try to also use uh, these type of things. I will suggest you to start from CME's sentence bird NLP library. You can create a simple secret by using ChatGPT. Put your sentences, check the C course, and try to understand which uh, sentence has the highest score. It will give you a kind of basic understanding. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And Robert, what do you think about that? Uh, if it's about uh, algorithmic authorship, uh, I can't uh, add anything anything more in, in this case. Uh, yeah. So maybe you know or when... Um like the question from Chris Romero, AI and SEO. He asks when style and tone seem to be more important as well. Can you show the question? A, a bit important. Have you created content that mirrors authoritative styles of other, yeah, here, yeah. uh, of other, um, have you, uh, that mirrors authoritative styles of other websites? Hmm. Style and tone, uh, great, great stuff. Uh, I think it's important uh, if you wanna, you know, uh, go for, uh, I'd say, e-commerce website and write a product uh, description or review. You will go for other tone instead of uh, analyze uh, stock market in Wall Street Journal. But uh, for Google. Um, I think it, it doesn't don't make make, uh, make a difference. Maybe the tone and this let's say micro configuration uh, will make your content more unique and uh, more 
human grade uh, and more. Yeah, that's it. Okay, I see. Um, Tom Wright was asking a very strange question about and one, the one, 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 yeah. one more thing. Uh, yeah. it, it will make your content different than the 80% of AI user in the world. So if you can play with uh, tone and if you can give even some examples in your prompt, for example, you acting as Forbes journalist, here is an example of article, blah, 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 write me insane style, whatever. Uh, it will it 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 make it will make your content better and different than the eighty five percent of other AI users and auto generated content in the world. Yeah, true. Uh, for uh, auto generated content, Tom Wright is asking a question about uh, data driving uh, program reviews. He can. Uh, he has access to this database himself, but he doesn't see uh, uh, that other affiliates care about that that much. Should he focus on this style content in a question and answer style or not? Quite specific, but do the promised will ask it, so I did. Hmm. Could you show one more time this question? I, I will read it slowly. Um... Uh, so basically, if he should use data drive and approach or mm -hmm. reviews of, on his affiliate mm -hmm. website, or yeah. but nobody else in the niche is using that. Uh, and what's the question? Is maybe maybe the problem in this case is the the niche because it's a, a gaming and nobody cares about the reviews. Yes, in, in, in yes, this case, is, is, is the case. But uh, where's the question? <laughs> so that, that is it. <laughs> uh, anyway, as for iGaming, I'm, I'm hearing lots of uh, questions from people. Why do I need this topical authority stuff? Why do I need this um, semantic search? I just buy backlinks and they work like magic. And uh, Corey, what do you think about that? So first of all, I am not against the links. I always tell it. I, al I also say that in Saigon too, if they want to sell me some links, I am okay with that as well. But when it comes to the page rank, uh, I can tell that if you actually use the semantic SEO and the topical author, first of all, your cost per link will be very much lowered because it will be very much easier for you to rank these specific documents even without links. And if you also add the links to the, your ingredients or to the, your methodology, it will be like cherry at the top. So another thing is that, for instance, in my methods, I always tell my partners that if I use even a single external link in an unnatural way, I will continue to use it always because I can tell you that I have lost 3,000 websites during the medic update. And that's why actually I am so sensitive and paranoid about the link, link graphs. And in this case, actually, uh, I can tell that if you add an unnatural link there, you will need to continue to add it so that you can prove that it was natural. If you just directly stop adding it, or if you are adding always at the same day, same heart, for instance. When it comes to links, my only rule is being patternless. And to be able to create that patternless structure, for instance, I will need to be always be active there. But if I use semantics in a really good way, you can use way much less links with way much less frequency. And still, you can actually dominate your niche. And I have already published lots of cases, even without links. And if you unite both of them, it will be even better. That's why we call our agents a holistic SEO. We use all of them uh, if it is necessary. And usually to explain my own mindset, I tell if rain or rainy weather helps me to rank higher, I will pray to God so that every day it rains. So even using actually rain, weather conditions, links, and in fact, to be honest, maybe as a confession, in 2019, when I returned back to the white at uh, SEO Industries, I even offered, because I was using DDoS attacks too much in PBN industry, and I even offered to the CEO that. I told him that I can send 30 millions of sessions from every country on this planet to the competitor, and we can even burn their disks in the server. He didn't approve it, but I will do it if the, he, was, he was approving it. So this is my mindset for SEO. If I'm able to rank, if I'm able to converge, I don't have a problem with that. One more minor thing there. After working in the health industry, I change these things. Now, if the person doesn't deserve to be ranking, I don't work with the person at the, at the first place because I have seen that some bad doctors, uh, when I rank them, some people were not happy when they come to the Turkey for treatments. 
So if the client is a good person, I am ranking them with all cost, let's say. Can I, can, can so I add something yes, to yes, this one? Course. So uh, I'm from the era of uh, link building, Black Hat SEO and stuff, and I fully understand it. But today, uh, the whole link building is just a budget game. Who has a bigger pocket, he will win the game. And two weeks ago, three weeks ago, uh, Kyle Roof told me quite decent, uh, quite nice anecdote. So let's imagine that you are running out of a uh, bear are, is chasing you. And the thing is, you don't need to be faster than bear. Than bear. You, need to be, you need to be a little bit faster than your colleague. And in this case, if everybody's playing with budgets, money, links, whatever, add something extra be more accurate for Google, be cheaper for Google, for retrieval, have uh, better signals from users, uh, whatever, have something you know extra, be just a little bit faster than your colleague. That's it. And it makes a difference at the end of the day. And it's why you need to focus on content planning, semantics, structures, uh, whatever, instead of just money game. And especially in the casino industry, by the way, for instance, even the small budget for the links is like 100,000 amount. I am talking about USD here. So in this case, actually, if you use the semantics, you will see that you won't need that much high budgets for the links. Uh, and another thing is that even if you use the same budget, it will be very much more safer for you. And at the same time, it will be showing its effect further and for longer time too. And I believe these are legit reasons to use every possibility in the SEO as much as possible. And yeah. Just, the person will get the and, and in following years, I'm quite sure, not quite sure, I'm 100% sure that the user signals comparing to link building, let's say, signals will be more, much more valuable for Google to rank websites. Even, you know, look for some pens. We have, uh, let's say, we have an example. I have an example. We are trying to rank. Uh, for uh, garden furniture in Poland, big, big, big keyword. Our competitors are Allegro, is like Polish eBay, and Lerwa Merleau is one of the biggest uh, store in Europe with uh, gardening, garden stuff. And we are number three. But the thing is, we have much, you know, uh, more links than Allegro. And, uh, and the letter one Merlin for this uh, specific page and this keyword, let's say, more page rank here for the, but they have t television users and overall quality. And we can, even if we will put three times more, five times more links in this case, we can't uh, jump to the number one spot because of the other signals instead of links, yeah, which are more important in time. I'm, 100% sure. In two years, three years, we will forget, uh, not forget about links, but in some, in some ranking state, other signals will be more, more important instead of links. Okay. Now, before we are wrapping up, uh, I'll be making a small quiz, blitz questions. And now camera on Robert. <laughs> You'll start. He'll be the first one. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. And the first question on the screen. Robert, shit in, shit out, and $1 million, all very helpful quality content uh, that really helps users, and only $1K, what would you choose? 1K. 1K, OK, next question. Invest in Bitcoin or in SEO? Oh, no, no crypto, no crypto. Uh, if we have uh, if any crypto guys on our audience, they know what happened last week. No crypto. I invest in crypto. I have crypto. And I, I came for, uh, I was a, like moon boy. And then I, I, I'm a you know, long-term investor to get back in value. <laughs> uh, SEO, yeah, SEO. Okay, next question. On page or backlinks? You can choose uh, only one. With no, with no explanation. You can explain in one or two sentences very briefly. Depends on the ranking state. At the beginning, mix. Uh, at the advance of the ranking state, the on-page. You'll, you'll choose on-page. OK, thank you so much.
Now, Corey, <laughs> your turn. Okay. Okay. Corey, vectors or knowledge graph entities? Vectors. I can create Why? knowledge graph entities whenever I want. Okay. Bimco, Google. Google. And the next question? John Mueller or Gary Elish? None of them. If I am you, can, you have to choose one. <laughs> Bill Slavsky. <laughs> if you insist on choosing one of them, again, I won't. I, let's not choose, please. <laughs> OK, thank you so much. But we'll be wrapping up. Uh, Anton, bring us everyone stage. But we'll be wrapping up a bit. And uh, if you were to choose only one thing that everyone has to remember from this webinar, what would it be, Robert? Stop doing shirin shit out. Think about prompts, think about uh, feeding on prompt level and giving as much knowledge to the language model on the left side and then expect a good result on, uh, on the right side and then try to fine tune and yeah, play with the input and yeah. You, have, you can even add like 16,000 tokens in the input right now. So it's a lot. And then you can expect a result and win the game instead of just randomly put uh, two, two sentences and expect uh, results. Uh, it won't happen. It, it worked uh, like one year ago, uh, but the window is cl already closed. So input, input, input. And yeah, uh, quality over quantity in this case. Ray, what's your takeaway, one takeaway that you want everyone to remember uh, with this webinar? Okay, so stop imitating the best ranking web pages and start understanding the fundamental needs of the search engines, especially for the future ecosystem of the search. So it will be good enough for even a decade, this advice, I believe. Yes, and I also liked my takeaways that goes when you have to think about what it goes for Google, what it goes for Bing, what it goes for you, what it goes for everyone else uh, to see your website and uh, your time as well. So where do you invest your time properly? Because your time also goes something. Uh, so uh, thank you so much. Where can people find you? What's your preferred channel where they can connect with you or follow you? All right. For me, uh, it's our public or the private communities and maybe Twitter or LinkedIn. They are good everywhere. Just search Korai in Google. You can find lots of places, but please don't send emails if possible. Uh, you can come to the community. Okay, thank you. Robert, where is the best place to connect with you? Uh, the best is um, uh, Facebook and the preferred one is Twitter because I'm trying to build some reach in Twitter, so yeah. I have one. I have like more one thousand followers on Twitter with no content there. So yeah, be my number uh, plus one <laughs> on Twitter. Yeah. And you can write me on Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, mail me, whatever. I'm I'm online everywhere. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone, for visiting and watching this webinar. Whether you are watching it live or when, whether you will be watching it uh, on the recording. Also, don't forget to subscribe to Duda not to miss any webinars in the future. And you can see how valuable it is to ask your questions live. So in order not to miss anything, make sure you subscribe to Anton's and Duda's uh, newsletters where they announce these webinars uh, in advance. And of course, put your like if you like the video and uh, subscribe to to this channel as well. Thank you, Corey. Thank you, Robert. You've been awesome and the information was so valuable. I'm absolutely sure that it, it has been helpful for the users. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.